back to another illuminating yet informative episode of Mid Sinaps podcast series. I am Hithvi Shah, your host, and today we have an exceptional guest with us, Dr. Rishi Lohia, a highly accomplished interventional cardiologist. And today we are going to explore the fascinating field of interventional cardiology and its vital role in managing heart failure. Heart failure is a global con- health concern affecting millions of people and significantly impacting their quality of life. Also, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's guest. As with over 13 years of experience, Dr. Rishi has performed more than 10,000 coronary interventions and 4,000 plus coronary angioplasties. He is also re- renowned for his expertise in complex coronary procedures. He is currently practicing at Kim's Kingsway Hospital as senior consultant in intervention cardiology. So, Dr. Rishi, welcome to our podcast, and it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So, to start with, could you share a bit about your first professional journey with us? Yeah. So, I am basically a graduate from B J Medical College, Pune, from where I did my M B B S and uh, uh, M D in internal medicine. then uh, i was trained in interventional cardiology at say uh, this km hospital and uh, said gs medical college i have also done my fellowships from american uh, college of cardiology and i had been to toyashi heart center to uh, attend the complex uh, coronary work and after that for last 8 years i have been practicing as an interventional cardiologist in the city of nagpur and presently i am affiliated to kims kings way hospital which is uh, a state of art uh, tertiary care center situated in nagpur yes that's an inspiring journey and thank you for sharing that with us now let's begin with the most asked question about heart failure can you tell us the key differences between traditional cardiology and interventional cardiology when it comes to treating heart failure so see uh, if you look at the journey or the evolution of management of heart failure uh, it has evolved significantly if you look at the hers textbook of cardiology which is uh, considered to be the bible of cardiology uh, and if you look at the uh, editions from 1960s the only probably options those were available for treating patients with heart failure were few molecules like mercury diuretics and digoxin there were hardly any therapies those were available and probably for all the medical practitioners a diagnosis of heart failure was supposed to be a dead end with no hopes Uh, remaining but eventually last few decades have seen <clears throat> real evolution in the management and today not only the medical management but now we have the interventional therapies which have really changed the outcomes they have given hope and promises to the patients and they have added fruitful years to the life of this heart failure patients yes that was very immense now with heart failure becoming increasingly prevalent worldwide what do you see as the primary drivers behind this trend so see uh, when you say heart failure it is nothing but the inability of heart to pump or supply the required blood flow to different organs and the major causative factors for heart failure are the common comorbidities which are showing increased prevalence over last few years one of the most uh, contributing factor is hypertension we all know the prevalence and occurrence of hypertension is on rise and because of that the occurrence of heft pep or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is increasing significantly the diabetes obesity decreased physical activity uh, then the mental stressors and addictions like nicotine and alcohol all of these are adding up to the coronary artery disease burden and a patient who suffers a myocardial infarction definitely lands up into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and again the increased incidence of coronary artery disease increase increasing the burden one more important thing is we all know now with the advanced revascularization therapies in the form of coronary interventions and uh, the cbgs the survival in patients post myocardial infarction has significantly increased and because of this also the number of patients living with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is on rise so if you have to put it in simple words probably hypertension diabetes obesity decreased physical activity and the increased occurrence of coronary artery disease is contributing significantly to increasing the prevalence of 
heart failure that we see across the globe yes so different approaches also plays a major role so now next question would be when you assess the progression of heart failure in patients what benchmarks do you use to decide on the appropriate intervention uh, strategy right so see uh, whenever we are following up with a patient of heart failure there are two things that we are concerned one thing is symptomatology or progression of symptoms and second is the biochemical and the uh, radiological and uh, echocardiographic findings th- those we see so if a patient who was otherwise uh, able to walk uh, let's assume 2 kilometers and now suddenly is feeling breathless while walking uh, 500 meters of distance probably we do understand that patient is decompensating and there is some progression of the disease uh, if you have to put it objectively 6 minute walk test is a commonly used entity which is a very simple to do test in our day to day clinical practice mm-hmm. and it talks about patient's symptomatology whether the symptoms are increasing and how well the patient is doing on the treatment now coming to the objective investigations so we have biomedical uh, biochemical investigations uh, the most commonly used as what we call it as nt pro bnp uh, it is a biomarker uh, which is a brain nitrouretic peptide and this level of nt pro bnp at the diagnosis and then on follow up talks a lot about patient's outcome so if a patient who is on the best of the possible medical therapy and if we see that the nt pro bnp levels are persistently more than 1300 probably these patients are not going to cater very well as compared to patients who have significant decrease in the value of this uh, nt pro bnp level then there are certain other biomarkers like st2 which talks about the total fibrosis burden in the myocardium and higher st2 levels suggest the poorer outcomes so uh, these are the main factors that we take into consideration along with that there are some un- indirect evidences like a patient with heart failure when he starts developing hyponatremia or if there is increase in the creatinine or fall in gfr we do know that that patient is landing up into cardiorenal syndrome and probably the outcomes would be very great if you talk about the echocardiography there are certain parameters which we are interested in Uh, there are some volumes we are uh, looking at one is left atrial volumes then we talk about the left ventricular end systolic and diastolic volumes and we talk about the ejection fraction with the newer advancement in echocardiography strain values also give lot of idea about the uh, outcomes and the prognosis in patients with heart failure so if we have a patient who has got a dilated lv and the parameters are not improving in spite of best of the therapies probably these patients are not going to to really great in long term and we have to be more aggressive development of pulmonary hypertension or progression of pulmonary hypertension on echocardiography in this subset of patients again increase the risk of complications yes that was really insightful now uh, initially we had spoken about comorbidities uh, so the my so my next question would be related to that what are the most critical factors or comorbidities you consider during risk stratification for these interventions right so see whenever you are choosing a patient for uh, any intervention uh, especially patients with heart failure who have progressive disease probably there are certain factors that we have to look into uh, again these are the factors which will also talk about the outcomes or patient's ability to tolerate the procedure and uh, respond positively in terms of outcomes so the factors are patient's baseline characteristics like age if you have a patient who is uh, like in his eighth decade of life probably the outcomes may not be very gratifying as compared to patient who is comparatively young then the associated comorbidities like if a patient has got low gfr or chronic kidney disease if patient has got long standing diabetes associated neuropathy old history of cardiac cerebrovascular events and neuropathies now these patients because of their comorbidities are be will be very challenging to tolerate the procedure and uh, getting the good results similarly patients who have uh, severe pulmonary hypertension at the time of diagnosis very dilated left ventricle they will be catering poor in terms of outcomes as compared to patients who have better baseline profiles so these are the factors uh, we take into consideration while defining the risk and benefit of a given procedure while choosing it for a patient Uh, so it is mostly personalized depending on the patient's history. Tailor-made plan rather than a generalized protocol, 
mm-hmm. because the patients they i mean they, these are highly demanding procedures and then patients are very uh, i would say uh, they have multiple comorbidities and even slightest error in diagnosing or uh, planning a procedure can prove dreadful yes it can be crucial now the concept of interventional uh, heart failure therapy integrates surgical catheter interventions and also mechanical support devices can you explain how this multidisciplinary approach improves patient outcomes so see uh, when we are talking about heart failure and we know that in spite of best of the medical therapy patient is not responding or the disease is progressing you think about uh, thinking out of the box and uh, using the advanced therapies now we have different advanced therapies in the form of percutaneous procedure or interventions we do have some surgical uh, uh, procedures which help and then there are massive uh, mechanical lv assist devices which can act as a bridge for these patients till the time you patient gets a definitive therapy now you cannot uh, choose one modality and decide one over the other most of times it is the combination of uh, one or more than one therapies as per the patient's requirement so as to improve the outcome now if a patient is a case of dilated cardiomyopathy and you are planning a heart transplant probably heart i mean donor hearts are not easily available and there are sometimes weeks to months before patients get those uh, donor hearts so till that time probably what is required is this patient needs to be maintained in good health with normal kidney functions and uh, maintaining other parameters so naturally in such cases we need the support of either ecmo device or left ventricular assist device so that the blood circulation to rest of the organs are well maintained so that the other organs uh, perform well when patient gets a transplanted heart in some cases if patient has got associated severe mitral regurgitation and uh, if you're not planning a transplant probably a mitral cleft is something which is coming up and uh, this can definitely improve the outcomes in terms of progression of heart failure and lv dilatation a patient with aortic stenosis with heart failure can be benefited greatly with uh, a tavi procedure and nowadays we we are seeing the increased utility of this modality and it's really proving game changer in this kind of patients so uh, if you have to put it in simple words whenever we are planning a therapy for heart failure patient with comorbidities and end stage heart disease probably many a times you have to use a combination of therapies from different uh, special sub specialties and you have to plan accordingly so it is a hard team approach wherein you uh, utilize the interventional knowledge the surgical skills and if required the advanced therapies in the form of lvets and uh, the ecmos so that you benefit the patient most Uh, yes so the next question would also be related to what you already mentioned so can you delve into uh, the specific catheter based interventions such as heart failure management such as tavi that you mentioned and mitral valve repair and how have these procedures evolved over the years right so see uh, first talking about tavi so what is tavi tavi is nothing but a percutaneous replacement of a diseased aortic valve we all know that when a patient develops aortic stenosis eventually because of increase on the, in the afterload on the left ventricle the lv st- starts failing and uh, there is decrease in the ejection fraction so if a patient has got aortic stenosis a critical aortic stenosis for a prolonged period this high probability that patient will land up in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now in such case scenario wherein a patient has got severe aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction probably doing a aortic valve surgical aortic valve replacement is very challenging and Uh, the outcomes are sometimes not really gratifying so to overcome this scenario percutaneous techniques have been developed and nowadays uh, without doing a surgery by percutaneous technique we can replace this diseased aortic wall we dilate uh, the calcified diseased aortic wall with a balloon and then replace it with a replace it with a uh, by uh, a tower wall or a prosthetic wall in uh, in the place of the diseased aortic wall and this is because it is a non surgical procedure the associated comorbidity or the surgical risk is very low patient does not require deep general anesthesia uh, there is no need of mechanical ventilators and patients uh, i mean respond very well to this therapy and we have seen the numbers of towers are increasing very significantly in last few years we have seen that uh, the patients have uh, really patients are really doing Uh, doing well on this towers and that's why now uh, we are very commonly 
utilizing this therapy in rightly chosen patients similarly talking about mitraclip now mitraclip is may patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because of dilatation of the left ventricle the mitral valve leaflets the coaptation of this mitral leaflets decrease and because of that there is secondary mitral regurgitation or central mitral regurgitation what we call it as now in this central mitral regurgitation if we uh, uh, if the uh, mitral regurgitation is not taken care of probably the lv uh, further dilates and the ejection fraction goes down the shape of lv which is normally a conical or bullet shape changes into a spherical shape and it further aggravates the myocardial injury now surgical replacement of this central mitral regurgitation is very challenging and uh, has got very high associated uh, surgical risk and that's why uh, these days there are percutaneous techniques which have been developed wherein without a surgical procedure going transcutaneously from right ventricle right atrium to uh, the doing a transeptal puncture and entering la and then mitral clips are put so that the coaptation of this regurgitating mitral valves is taken care of and the size of the mitral orifice reduces and the further progression of heart failure is reduced now these two uh, modalities the tower and mitral clip they have really uh, proven game changer in rightly chosen patients and uh, these have really contributed significantly in reducing the progression of heart failure in this group of patients yes the advancements over the years are incredible and as we conclude today's session thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today it has been an it has been enlightening to learn about the advancements and strategies in interventional cardiology for heart failure management and it was a pleasure to have you have this discussion with you thank you yes and to and a heartfelt thank you to our audience for tuning in And if you are a healthcare professional who is eager to delve deeper into medical topics or have questions, don't hesitate to join us on the MedSynapse platform. MedSynapse platform is not just a resource; it's a dynamic space where you can connect with your medical peers, participate in make meaningful discussions, and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. Until next time, stay healthy and take care.